Knoppel is a professor and chair of the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of South Carolina, Columbia, University. South Carolina. <laughs> you guys are kind of moving around a lot, but we're going to the next speaker right now. <laughs> so no one moves. No, no, no. Just hang tight. An hour more right. and we'll have lunch. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Oppel, uh, Dr. Oppel has more than 25 years of experience conducting research and teaching classes on language old. learning and working with children, adolescents, and adults with language problems and language-based learning deficits. Currently, his research focuses on the underlying linguistic components that support the development of word level, reading, and spelling. Dr. Oppel has published extensively in peer-reviewed journals and is frequently invited to speak at national, state, and local conferences about spoken language disabilities and assessment and remediation of reading, writing, and spelling disabilities, perfect for the conference today. Dr. Oppel is the formal, former, former editor of, editor of, editor in chief of speech language, of language, speech, and hearing services in the schools, the journal. He is a fellow and certified member of the American Speech Language Hearing Association, and we are so happy to have him here today. Welcome, Dr. Oppel. Where's the, the pointer thing about it? Do we know where the thingy bobber is? Is that it there? No. Looks like it might. Is that it? Came left. Did he take it with him? I don't know. We'll see. Okay, I'll go check. Okay, that's fine. All right, can you hear me okay? Um, I don't like going third because I keep writing all these notes on my handout that I want to say um, that I hadn't planned on saying. So a couple things. First of all, why am I doing this? Well, because I was invited. But second of all, because um, I'm a speech language pathologist by education and I'm a total language nerd. Um, and so I like thinking about anything that has to do with language. I especially like thinking about the linguistic awareness skills that underpin uh, reading and spelling. When my daughter uh, was very young, I drive her to piano lessons, and we would play metalinguistic games in the car. Uh, and I thought my wife was going to shoot me when one time at dinner she said, I know, let's play metalinguistic games. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, the other thing that maybe I thought about from the two other speakers is that um, I started off just thinking about spoken language. Uh, that was what I was doing when I was early on. And then I got really hooked on the idea of written language. So by written language, I mean reading, writing, and spelling. And so both of them, I'm going to say spoken language and written language, both of them um, rely on phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, etc. The difference is to be in the written language area, I've got to think about it, at least initially. Or even when Kate put up those words that we had never seen before, I had to think about sounds and patterns and such. So um, getting back to what Will said, um, I have run into many of uh, an educator or so who will say, I don't know why Johnny doesn't get it because he speaks just fine. And that's usually when I slap him in the face because <laughs> it's, you have to think about our language in order to be successful at reading, writing, and spelling. Um, and the other note I wrote is that I'm going to be asking you, because I know you're all thinking about lunch, I'm going to be asking you some questions and I would like you to turn to your neighbor and quietly discuss the question and then um, offer to uh, give the answer. So here's our first question. I don't know if this is going to work or not. There it is. Okay. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, uh, what do you think this word means? Okay. I've lost you already. All righty. Okay. Um, I'm not going to make you go up to the microphone. I'm sorry. Who would like to volunteer and tell me what? How many people have seen this word before? One or two. Okay. Yes. What do you think it means? I, I think Ben Powers is a shenanigan. Okay. All right. So, and you think that means what? Some of the shenanigans, okay. <laughs> Anybody have a, yes ma'am? 
an instigator of shenanigans. Okay, any other ideas? Okay, actually it, it oops. Person who investigates shenanigans. Okay. Alrighty, so, um, for the, what? Oh, for the record, I'm hopefully not going to be up to shenanigans here, but it's a good example of how, do you, how you had to use your morphological awareness to try to get at the meaning of that word that you've never seen before. Alrighty, so um, this is what I want to accomplish um, before you go to lunch. What is morphological awareness? Uh, why is it important for reading, writing, and spelling? How does it develop? Because I'm one of these people that thinks, unless you know how a skill develops, you cannot assess or treat it. Um, and how do we help st students who are struggling with spelling and reading um, by assessing them and then in intervening or instructing them in that area? And then I'm going to summarize that. Um, I'm from California. I'm a fast talker, so you have to listen quickly. <laughs> OK, so I don't know. I didn't know until um, Will asked people, to, or maybe it was, um, maybe it was Tiffany. Uh, to raise your hand who you were. Um, so some of this may seem very basic, but I want to make sure we're all on the same level. Um, so morphological awareness generally is defined as that conscious awareness of the smallest units of meaning in our language, which we call morphemes. Okay? Um, so for the examples up there, cat is a one morpheme word because if you bring it smaller, it's going to lose meaning. Okay? But if I put the S on the end of cats, I now, end of cat, I now have uh, increased meaning, meaning there's more than one of that thing, okay? And so the rest you can see uh, when I put on the present progressive ing, it tells me when the stopping's happen, when the stop is happening. Uh, when I put the on onto fair, I changed the meaning dramatically, but it added meaning to that. And the same thing when I put the ly on the end too. So uh, a word that we're used to saying or reading or talking about or listening to can have way more than just one morpheme word, okay? One morpheme. Um, so when we talk about, when I talk about a base word, I'm talking about a word like cat. It just has one morpheme, one meaning, okay? But when I put on either the prefix or the suffix on the end, I'm adding additional meaning, and the more general term is affix. I put an affix on it, okay? So what we know is that affixes can be, uh, can slightly or notably change the meaning of the base word onto which you stick it. Um, so we can talk about, in, I'll talk, you listen, about inflectional morphemes, okay? And they tell us a little bit more when I hook them onto a base word, they tell me a little bit more about when something happened and happened or the um, size or the quantity of it, but they don't really change the meaning of the base word that much, okay? So when I take the verb walk and I put the past tense or the progressive or uh, the, the present S, um, it's still the same act. It's just telling you when it happened, okay? Uh, same thing, like I said, for cats or bigger, biggest. Um, they, it's really retaining the meaning of the base word and just slightly modifying it. Derivational morphemes are much different, much more different than that, because if I put a prefix or suffix on a base word that is derivational, I actually am going to change the meaning of the word and or the class of the word, okay? So if we take the word teach, it's a great verb, I put on the ER onto it, now it means a person who does that. Not unlike, no, yeah. Okay, and same thing with fair and unfair. When I put the on as, as a prefix on it, the meaning is 180 degrees different now. Okay. So derivational um, morphemes are uh, more drastic uh, as far as what they do to base words. So being an SLP by trade, I say, what, does that, what are the implications? Well, if I'm trying to help a student think more about affixes, I'm sure as heck not going to start off with derivational morphemes because they're more challenging, okay? But even within the derivational morpheme category, there are differences too. So we have what are called transparent derivations. And so that means that when I look at a base word and a derived word and I see the base word in the derived word, I hear the base word in the derived word, then it's transparent, okay? So the idea of friend and friendly, I still hear friend and friendly, I see it. And so it may be a little bit easier for me, uh, the first time I see a word like that, to figure out, oh, it's related to friend. Or the first time I want to write friendly, I'll say, well, I, I recognize friend is in there, I'm going to use that base word to help me spell it. Okay. Then we have what are called shift. And I have to make sure I got the F in there, okay? <laughs> 
shift derivations, okay? And that means something has changed when I put on that affix. So I either change the look of it or I change the sound of it. So it's an orthographic shift or a phonological shift, okay? So when I took silly and made it into the dry form silliness, I still hear silly and silliness, but I no longer see the word, the base word silly in there, okay? And then, so that's an orthographic shift. And then with magic and magician, I still see magic and magician, but I sure as heck don't um, hear magic and magician. So that was a phonological shift. So guess what? Those are a little bit more challenging for people to realize those words are related to one another. Okay. Then we have the end all to be all, and those are opaque derivations. And that means I no longer see or hear the base word in that derived word. Okay. So with admission, I no longer see admit in there, and I don't hear it in there. So it's more taxing for me to recognize that they're related to one another. Why do I care about if they're related to one another? Because that brings out the meaning part. Okay. okay, so those are more challenging. So again, being the educator, clinician, uh, person who's helping other students, it would be really stupid for me to start with these kind of derivations, okay? Because I'm taxing the students to think about sound and meaning and that they're, neither one's there, but it's still related to the base word. Okay, so being able to think about morphemes can be incredibly helpful. We take this um, thought by Jack Handy who said maybe in, in order to understand mankind, we have to look at the word itself, mankind. Basically it's made up of two separate words, mank and eind. What do these words mean? It's a mystery and so is mankind. All right, not using good morphological awareness there. Okay, um, so we will worry about him later. Okay. So, um, I feel like I'm yelling. Am I yelling? Okay. Um, so, let's talk about the definition of morphological awareness. Almost everybody uses that uh, term very similar to, or a definition very similar to what I started off with, which was that conscious awareness of the smallest unit of meaning morphemes. Okay. Um, but there's some problems with that. Okay. So, when people use a general definition, then often they use general tasks to assess that. Okay? So if Kate's doing a, a study with morphological awareness, she might use task A and B. Tiffany might use task B and E. Tony might use C and D. And they're all making the kids or individuals think about morphemes. But the problem is, is we don't know if they're measuring the same skill because we haven't looked at that. Okay? The different tasks look different. Are they measuring the same skill? Okay. Um, we don't know whether um, they're um, one, uh, a set of tasks that measure the same construct or they're measuring different parts of the same construct. And so um, because, oh, and that last thing is, I should read my slide here, is that most of the ones that folks have used in research and such are oral um, measures of morphological awareness. But as I just showed you with Shenanigator, we have to apply that in written forms as well. Um, so uh, I decided I didn't like that because uh, it leads to people using different tasks and at the end, when we're comparing this study to this study, how do we know it's not the task that cause differences, if there's differences, versus uh, some other factor that you were looking at. Um, so we came up with this definition, it was still the conscious awareness of the smallest units of meaning, but, and put in the different kinds of knowledges there, it should be, we should be measuring, and it's based on how we have to apply our morphological awareness when we're talking and when we're um, in a literate activity. So we, I have to be able to think about how many units in a word, okay? How many morphological units? Um, and so, again, with Shenanigator, I think all of you realize, okay, the OR at the end is telling me something about shenanigans, okay? Uh, and when you, if I had just said that orally, you would have to do that. And when you saw it written, you have to do that. So we have to recognize how many morphemes are in a word in order to be successful um, when we're reading or spelling. We also have to know what those, those morphemes look like and what they mean. Um, and so, um, as Kate mentioned, um, pretty much all our written affixes are spelled the same way, which is very, very cool because, as she said, and as Ken said this morning, we have a morphophonological writing system. 
And so we have to honor morphology as much as we do phonology. So I have to be able to look at those and say, oh, I recognize that as an additional unit of meaning that's telling me something about that word. Okay? And then also, like I said, we have to know how do these extra morphemes, these extra affixes, affect the meaning of a base word. We also have to know when we're talking about the written system that sometimes when I add on a suffix to a word, I actually modify the base word onto which it was hooked. Okay? We call that the juncture. Okay? So at the juncture of where the base word and the, the um, suffix come together, sometimes I have to change something. Okay? So I might be adding an extra P, like in the word hopping, to hop, or I might be getting rid of part of the base word, um, the E, because I add the past tense onto it. I, if I had H-O-P-E-E-D, someone might think you're doing something else besides hoping. So, I've got to understand those rules as well. And then the other thing I need to do, and I'll come back to why this is important in a minute, is realize that ba the relation between base words and derived words. So when Kate put up the whole thing about kind and kindness and kindly and all that, I thought, ooh, that ties into what I'm going to say. Okay. <laughs> um, so I have to realize that a lot of our words are related because they come from the same base word. Okay? So it would make sense then that we would think about that in um, figuring out how we help students because it may be a particular student is having problems with bullet number two or bullet number three, but not bullet number one. Okay. All right, um, so this is a fancy thing. How to go backwards? Okay, so that was, that's one of the main goals right now in our lab is to see is morphological awareness a one-dimensional kind of construct or is it multi-dimensional? Multi if it's multidimensional, then it means I got to have tasks that measure each of those. Okay? So Yaakov did this really cool looking little di diagram here. And, but the important thing here is that what we found is there's three factors to morphological awareness. When we're measuring it, we have the factor of the items. Okay? So items give us information about morphological awareness. But then we had these different domains, these four domains, where they were, they were saying, um, several of the tasks are measuring the same domain. And then we just have the overall notion of morphological awareness. So what that means is, skill one, the tasks that we use to measure morphological awareness, they clump together and they actually measure um, a person's knowledge or awareness of spoken and written morphemes. So I didn't plan this. I didn't even tell Yaakov, our, my stack guy, this is how I define morphological awareness. But it was very cool because it came out that way. Um, so the second types of tasks are looking at the meanings of affixes and what they do um, when you attach them and how they change the grammatical class and such. The third one had to do with that juncture idea I just talked about. Okay? And the fourth one had to do with the relation between base words and derived words. So, so what it was saying is that you've got to think about the items on the tasks and you've got to think about which of these four domains is it measuring if I really want to get a good picture of morphological awareness. And what was kind of neat on this is that, so we, um, our first year of this, we ran about 1,200 kids. We're now up past 4,000 kids. But what we find is that it's, um, your performance at the item level is not really based on how good or poor a reader or speller you are. It's based on the items themselves, which is nice because it's saying this is something that's measuring the actual skill, and it's not based on uh, your reading or your spelling abilities. And then there's a thing I wrote. Oh, and the other thing is, is that um, in our tasks, we have both inflectional um, morphemes and derivational morphemes. And if you look at the literature, it should say the easier items should be the ones that have inflected morphemes on them. And that was true almost all the time, but not always. So we had some tasks where there was no difference if the task involved an inflectional or derived um, morpheme. And sometimes it was easier when it was a derivation, which goes to show you got to think about what you're trying to measure and not assume that one thing's always going to be easy. But usually the inflectional morphemes are easier. So that was that. I've probably talked about a third of my talk in five minutes, but that's OK. Um, <laughs> uh, um, why do we care about morphological awareness? Um, well, I care about it because what we know is there's a strong relation between morphological awareness and spelling and reading. 
That should be a duh statement because we know our written language is morphophonemic. Um, but what's interesting, so folks have done studies that say, okay, I want to see how much does phonemic awareness um, contribute to spelling ability, morphological awareness, et cetera. Um, and even when phonemic awareness is considered, it's important, morphological awareness also comes in as an important contributor to reading and spelling. And in some studies, it's the only contributor. It, phonemic awareness gets dropped out. And you would say, well, that's fascinating. But if you think about it, when we're thinking about these extra morphings we stick onto words, God bless you, um, it makes you think about sound, pattern, and meaning. So morphings give you a lot of bang for your buck. Okay? Um, the other thing is, is that I think you all know that um, for students, at least in the US, they have first and second grade to learn to read, and then bingo, bango, they're supposed to be learning to, uh, reading to learn, right? Um, so what happens in third grade? How does the third grade text look different than first and second grade? It's the real kind of written language, right? And so when you get to third grade text and on up, for every one simple morphing word, there are four multimorphemic words. So that's another hello. We should be helping them think about that, okay? And so um, some folks have looked at that in 93% of the words that individuals read from kindergarten through college fall into these morphological families. So that's another one that tells me I gotta make sure my student, uh, my typically developing students and my students who are struggling are thinking about morphemes because it's gonna help them when they get to that stage there. Um, so I already mentioned this a, a little bit but it's gonna be helpful for both spelling and reading. So the first time I have to spell a word that I've never spelled before, if it's um, one, more than one morpheme, I can start to bring my knowledge, if I have it, of what those extra uh, affixes look like, what they sound like, et cetera. Same thing when I read, um, that um, I love that Kate had the bit from Harry Potter, because what I love about Harry Potter is what, she, what the author does with the language. And you know, there are a lot of different words in there, but so many of them have morphemes, extra morphemes that we recognize in there. Um, they also help us think about pronunciation and spelling. So when I look at the SH in mishap, I realize it's not SH like sh, it's a prefix and a base word, okay? So I know how to pronounce that, okay? And I can think about when I'm reading that. But when I look at the SH in fish, I realize, oh, that's just a base word. So I know where the word boundary is for that, okay? Same thing with a suffix like IVE. Usually, not always, but usually when you attach it to a base word, it says if, like in detective. But if it's a one morphing word, it's almost, almost always I've. Okay? So being aware of those can help us know how to pronounce different words. Um, and then like I said earlier, knowledge of the spelling of a base word can go ahead and help us think about how do we spell or read these derived words. Okay? Uh, it's also helpful for reading comprehension. So I'm not going to be talking about that, but I'm going to for a minute. So I'm reading a passage, and I come to a word I've never seen before. If it's multimorphemic, I can break it down into its individual morphemes, say, what do I know about those individual morphemes, put them together to get some kind of meaning from that word I've never seen before, and once I have that, I figure out, okay, what does it mean in the sentence, and hopefully for the text, okay? So again, that's what I was making you do with uh, Shenanigator, was to break it down and figure out uh, what the meaning of the individual morphemes were to put them together. And then it also has important educational ramifications. So Louise has been talking about this forever, and unfortunately, not forever, I'm sorry, but it sounds really bad. In the last two years, sorry. No, but I mean, she's been, she's been saying this for a long time, and it hasn't changed practice. You know, you go into elementary schools, let's say, and it's not uncommon to see teachers, general ed teachers, doing phonemic awareness activities. It's very uncommon to see people doing morphological awareness activities, okay? So that's, that's a real educational implication is we know it's important, but not as many people are doing it, okay? Um, what we do know is that when you include morphological awareness as part of an instructional package, 
that we see really nice growth, okay? So in some of our work, we would see in eight or nine weeks, growth of uh, more than 1.0 effect size, which means they were going up more than one standard deviation in what they were understanding about morphemes. Um, we did a really cool study where we went into schools that were high, uh, excuse me, low SES schools, where 72 or 3 percent of the kids were on free and reduced lunch. Okay? And we were doing these morphological awareness um, activities with them. And one of my favorite side comments of this is we had a kindergarten boy. This was a pullout because it was part of a, a grant. Uh, and the, uh, we had been working on different um, affixes. And the boy comes in and says to the whole class, did you know that S can mean more than one? <laughs> but that's cool. At kindergarten, he's talking about that. Okay. All right. So let me talk about spelling for a minute because spelling's a love of mine. And uh, I was talking at someone at the break who said that, you know, she was told by somebody else that, well, forget spelling. It's not important. Yeah. Yeah. So let's nail them to the cross on that one. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so, but what we know about spelling, it's really the, one of the best windows into what individuals can think about as far as language goes. Okay. So when we do our spelling analysis, we look at what do the errors tell us about the student's uh, phonemic awareness, morphological awareness, orthographic knowledge, et cetera. Okay. Um, so it's really a good window into whether a student can or can't use these different linguistic awareness skills. So I'm going to ask you to use your linguistic awareness skills to spell a word that I think most of you have not seen before or heard before, although this one really is a real word. So either on your piece of paper in your head, I want you to spell this word. Okay? And the word is cyber loafing, cyber loafing. It means playing around, around on the computer at work when you should be working. <laughs> I know no one's ever done this, but so the word is cyber loafing. It's a great word, and it's a real word. Okay, who would like to tell me how you spelled cyber loafing? Yes, ma'am. That was very close. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. So here we go. There it is. Okay. Everybody's happy you got it right. <laughs> Doesn't take much for this crowd. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so how many people had seen that word before? Okay, a few. Cool. All right. How many of you had to apply some knowledge to figure out how to spell that word? What knowledge did you apply? Cyber, you know, has to do with computers. You know what to, you've heard that people loaf around, right? So, yeah, you know that it can be happening, that's right. So, you'd be able to take, that's what you did, is you used your morphological awareness knowledge. You used your knowledge of different um, parts of meaning to put it all together, okay? So, you, very good, you can have your sandwich at lunch now. Okay, so let's talk about development. Or I'll talk, you listen about development, okay? Um, so you have to watch me for a second, sorry. Um, it used to be that people said, as children are developing, first they get phonemic awareness skills. Then they get orthographic awareness or knowledge. And then they get morphological awareness, okay? That was a stage theory, okay? What we know is that that's not actually what happens, okay? Um, I use the term rep repertoire um, theory or overlapping waves theory, but the idea is as children who are typically developing get to about five or so, they start to show some indication of awareness of phonemes and morphemes and orthography. Okay? Um, and so what we know is morphological awareness begins very early in childhood and continues. Okay? So um, some of my favorite studies, one was done here by Julie Walter, um, is where um, kindergarten and first grade kids are asked to spell one versus two morphing words. Okay? So those of you who are around typically developing young kids or older students who are struggling with phonemic awareness, you know that when there's a cluster or a blend, whatever you call two consonants together, okay, 
um, and that kids who are just learning to think about this will drop one of those letters. Okay? And especially if it's what we call a nasal sound, mm, mm, or what we call the liquid sounds, L's and R's, those babies just drop. Okay? So if a student is asked to spell the word bind, then she might just spell B-I-D. Okay? Because she's not recognizing there's a blend there, and it's got that dang nasal in there. Okay? Um, so that's very typical. So the kids were given words like that and also words like rained. And when you listen to them, they have the same number of morphemes in them. Excuse me, same number of phonemes in them. Okay? But what students would do more than chance level, they would spell bind, B-I-D, and rained, R-A-N-D. Which if you're a language nerd like me, you get these goosebumps. Okay? <laughs> because what it was saying is, that at some level they're realizing there's more than rain here. I've got to somehow mark it. Okay? So they're starting to recognize there's additional meaning in rain than there is in bind. So I've got to do something extra for that, which I think is really cool. So we're seeing this in kindergarten first graders, uh, which says, forget that stage theory. You know, it's happening right now. In some of our work, we've um, seen differences between K1 and 2 on some of the tasks that we give. So knowing that farm is related to farmer or having them circle um, prefixes and suffixes in writing, it differentiates between K1 and 2. So um, primary grade students are showing this morphological awareness knowledge. Okay? Um, and so why do I care about that? Again, because for the general ed folks in the room, um, if, when you start to integrate morphological awareness, it should be starting the primary grades. Okay? Especially because we want them to think about the morpho of the morphophonemic written language system. Okay. Alrighty, next slide. Um, so some of the work, say by Ginger Berninger, she looked at kids first through sixth grade. And she found the largest, quickest growth in the first three grades, but still saw it growing um, beyond that. And in fact, I would argue that we are all still developing more morphological awareness abilities, okay? Thinking more and more about those morphemes. Um, so, but we don't know enough about this, so we need more. And so we're, in our lab, we're looking at um, how different tasks are measuring morphological awareness in kids from first to sixth grade. Um, so let's talk about assessment. How am I doing? Where am I right now? Am I okay? Okay, all right. So, um, those of you who test students know that there are norm reference um, measures, and what they do is they tell us, yes, the kid's typical or not typical. Okay? So what kind of norm reference measures do we have morphological awareness? None. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Okay. <laughs> however, however, you can look at some measures that people often give and realize they call it one thing, but it's really morphological awareness. Okay, so I bet a lot of people in this room have heard of the self. Okay, um, so there's a subtask called word structure where you say, finish this sentence, this man sings, he's called a singer. Okay, you did well. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, it's making them think about, okay, how do I take this verb and change it into a person? Okay, so it's not saying, oh, we're just chatting and doing this, and by the way, the kid said, oh, you know, Tony's a good singer. Um, that's, the student's not thinking about the person morpheme there. But this makes the kid think about morphology. Okay? And so there are some other standardized tests. Some of you may have seen these or not seen these, um, where they say one thing, but they're really measuring morphological awareness. So, you know, complete this sentence with, they don't say an affix word. Here's one boat, here are two, both say boats. What's interesting also, and that's really tiny um, wording there, but you can also look at, well, what kinds of extra morphemes, affixes, are they targeting? And so if you look down, uh, the team looks at uh, inflections uh, and no, they have no derived um, morphemes on there. The told has some, uh, lots of inflections, so plurals, possessives, and then uh, only three derivational morphemes. And I don't have to read these all to you, but if you scan down, you'll see that they vary in the type of affixes they're making kids think about, 
uh, and um, the variety of them. Okay. Um, so what's the bottom line for this is uh, if you need some kind of norm number, you could use a subtest from someplace else, from some other measure, but you're going to have to say it's not called that, but that's what it's measuring. Okay. But then the caveat is they're pretty limited in scope, like I said. So um, the range of different affixes is pretty small. Most of them are measuring inflectional morphology and not derivation morphology. Okay. All right, then we have criterion reference measures. And you know, those are the ones, at least for those who are working with students who are struggling, tell us what should we do when we help the students. Okay. And the thing is, is that um, there are lots of different morphological awareness tasks that you can get from the research literature. Okay? Um, and so if I use a number of those, I might get a better picture of my students' morphological awareness skills. Um, we're using eight different tasks in our um, lab because they fit with our definition. So, well, who, can you see that? Okay, so I want to talk about two tasks at a time. So we have two tasks, one's called sen segmenting, and one's called affix identification. And those are being used to get an idea of how aware is a student of spoken and written morphemes. Okay. So for example, segmenting is, this is earth shattering, they count how many morphemes in a word. So it's no different than a phonemic segmentation task, but they're gonna hear a word and they're going to tap out, which I can't do on the slide, so I'm gonna show you, um, we're gonna circle how many morphemes, and for young kids, we call them add-ons, okay? Um, and so with this one, I wanna see, can they recognize how many beyond the base word are in there? And so those are the answers to those, okay? So can't, and that's purely oral or spoken, okay? And then we have this, which is the affix ID task, and then they're gonna see a bunch of these weird, strange words they've never seen before, but they have real affixes in them. And they need to go down and find those add-ons and circle them, okay? So you've never seen number three, but I bet you all recognize the last four letters of that because that's a very common affix in our language, okay? So we would do that, and I can't circle, I can't figure out how to circle this, but they would hopefully pick those out, okay? Everybody hunky-dory with that? Okay. All right, so the next two have to do with awareness of how, what the meaning of the affixes are and what they, how they change the base word. So we have an affix meaning task and a suffix choice task, okay? So with, sorry, let me go back. I don't know, hold on, hold on a second. So with the affix meaning task, um, we're getting an idea of, um, they're gonna hear these affixes attached to words they've never heard before, but can they help figure out what the meaning of the word is based on that affix? And then um, the suffix choice one is where, so that's really spoken, okay? And then the uh, suffix choice one is where they're going to see a word and part of it's missing and they have to figure out which one uh, of the number of choices is the correct one based on the meaning of the sentence. So the affix meaning ones gives them a nonsense words like juffed and says, if that means joy, which word means full of or having the quality of joy? And they have to decide A, B, C, or D. Okay, same thing with Jad. So I could give you a minute to answer this, but I think you would anyway. So those are the right answers. So because if you know what an affix means and it gets attached to a nonsense word, you still be, should be able to figure out what um, the answer would be. And the suffix choice one then is where we give them a sentence with a missing word, there are four related words and they have to figure out which one of those best fits the sentence, okay? So that's all hunky-dory, so those are the answers to that one. This one, by the way, we only give third to sixth grade because it's heavy uh, in reading abilities. All right, the next two tasks have to do with um, uh, the awareness of how, when I add affixes to the word, what does it do to the base word? Um, and so one is a very simple, just spelling test. That's all it is. But every single word is a multimorphemic word, okay? So it's like your traditional spelling test. Say the word, say the sentence, kid writes it, okay? And then with the derivational spelling task, um, 
we give them a sentence where the base portion of the word is still there, and they have to decide which of these, um, uh, in this case, the, the um, suffix, is going to complete that word. And if you'll notice, I don't remember how I point, but in the first one there, because when we add on the er to plate, it modifies the base word, they have to choose that one because it's showing that that word is modified. Okay? Um, so uh, those two uh, are fitting that third part of our definition. And it's interesting because this was, um, had the best probability of students getting this correctly of all six grades. Uh, and then the last two have to do with that idea of the awareness between a base word and a uh, derived word, a reflected word, and the meaning that they share. And so we call it the relative's task. Even the Joanne Carlisle didn't call it that, but this is Joanne Carlisle's task. Um, and, but I'll tell you in a minute why we call it relatives. Um, and it's just looking at um, can they use a base word to figure out what the inflected derived word would be, or the opposite, give them an inflected derived word, and can they figure out what the base would be? So, um, you know, act, when he grows up, he wants to be an, and they're supposed to fill in with the word actor. And the only difference between the two tasks is one is purely spoken, and the other one is written. Okay. Everybody's hunky dory with that? Okay. The last thing to keep in mind is, like I said earlier, we can use student spellings to give us an idea of morphological awareness abilities. So when we see a student spell a word, and the student doesn't even include the affix, or when the affix is, is attached, it's spelled incorrectly, or when it was supposed to modify the base word, it hasn't done that, then we say, I think this is a morphological awareness task, uh, problem, and we follow up on that. So if this kid doesn't put on the plural S on cat, spells the plural uh, the way it sounds versus the way it's supposed to be spelled, um, or didn't do the modification there, those are suggesting morphological awareness problems. And the same thing if the student can spell please hunky-dory, because spells pleasure, and doesn't use please to spell pleasure, then that could be a morphological awareness um, problem too. So let me ask you this. Of these four misspellings, which one do you think is tell, saying there might be a morphological awareness issue? So they're all misspelled, but one of them you're going to say, hmm, I think this might be a morphological awareness issue. I see, okay, very good. There we go. That was my fancy thing for doing that. Okay, which one of these do you think is a morphological awareness issue? Bingo, bingo. All right. So that's just, that's a whole other thing that we can be looking at is, morpholo is spelling errors and stuff. So to summarize the criteria and reference measures, we have to think about how, what, factors might influence how well or how poorly a student does. So inflectional versus derivational, I already mentioned that. The transparency between the derived word and the base word. So some are transparent, some are shifty, and some are opaque. Okay. Um, and then also the word frequency, because we know that when students are asked to um, spell der uh, derived words, they tend to do better when the base word is a high frequency word which also suggests they're using the base word to think about the derived word, okay? Um, so hopefully, ideally, sometime soon, there'll be a norm reference morphological words measure that takes all those things into account. Here's a person who's struggling with morphological awareness. He says, fellow octopi or octopus is octopi. Dang, it's hard to speak, start a speech with this crowd. Okay. <laughs> it's amazing how many uh, comics or whatever you can find that are morphological awareness. All right. Um, oh, Lordy. Okay, so let's talk about instruction or intervention. So remember, if I'm working with an individual student or a small group of students, I might be working on uh, part, one area of that general or that definition where they need help, okay? Or if I'm doing the whole class, um, we do what we call the crop duster approach. Everybody gets everything, okay? Um, so let me give you some examples of what we've done uh, in some of our intervention studies. These have been done, well, for different ages, okay. So this is the word relatives task, and that's where the word relative came in, okay. So we want to see, we want to help students realize words are related because they share the same base word, and they share the same meaning, okay. So sometimes we'll start off um, 
with an example of what we're talking about, how things are related. So I might say, you know, Kate looks and sounds just like her mom. Tiffany looks like her mom but doesn't sound like her. Julie sounds like her mom but doesn't look like her. And Tony doesn't look or sound like his mom. But they all are related to those moms. Okay? So they get the idea how relatives are connected. Okay? In some schools, we weren't sure about parents in the home, so we'll say, talk about cats and have pictures of cats that look and sound the same, sound or don't look the same, and the cat doesn't look like any other cat, but it's still a cat. Okay? So we get that idea of things are related to one another um, in, by meaning. Okay? And so then what we do is we say, now let's talk about some words and think about relatives of those words. Okay? So if I say, what are some relatives of act? You're going to say, actor, active, action. Okay? So each time I would do that, so someone said actor, I'd say, now do you really agree that that shares meaning? Well, yeah, because I can act on the stage. I'm an actor. Okay. Uh, so I'm so glad someone said actor. Um, so I would say, okay, so let's think about how could we spell actor using the base word. Well, what do you know about the er at the end of word, at ends of words, when we add an er onto the end of a word? What does it look like? It can be E-R, O-R, could be I-R-E. So we write them all down like this. And then I'll say, okay, so which one matches the picture in your head? And the student's probably going to say that one. Okay. So we help the student think about how do I spell this word based on that they share the meaning. Even if the student picked A-C-T-E-R, I would say, that was close, but this is the one. Okay. Because I'd rather have a student spell actor A-C-T-E-R than saying, spelling it A-K-T-R. Okay. But we're teaching the strategy of how you use the base word to spell the re uh, related word. Same thing, someone said action. I was really glad they said that. I'll say to the students, what do we know about the shun? And many people, kids will say T-I-O-N. I'll say, that's great. Let's put them together. Does that match the picture in your head? Now let's get rid of it and we get to action. So we're helping them think about, if I have to spell a word that's more than one meaning to it, how do I use the main relative to get at the related relative? And we stay away from the word families because that means something different in education. Okay. All right, we do word sorts. So I think many of you are used to word sorts um, where you give students some cards and uh, the words vary in some kind of orthographic pattern, long versus short, let's say, and the student has to divvy them up and then think about uh, why is these words in these cards are related and these this way. So um, the idea of a word sort is you're making the student come up with the rule or the pattern. If we do that, it's going to stick better than if we don't. Okay? So if I were to give you all of these words and I would say, hmm, they all kind of end with the same letter, but let's think about this. How would you divvy them up? Okay? And because I don't know where I am with my timing, I would do this <laughs> and divvy them up this way. Okay? 50, oh, 15 minutes? Oh, I'm going to be done early. Okay, so <laughs> rocks, apples, all of them mean more than one, right? But I only added an S onto the ones in the left column, but in the right column, I actually added ES. So I can do S or ES to mean more than one. Why the heck did I decide to put ES on the right column and just S on the left column? Because, are you SLP? Oh, wow. Because they ended in what we call fricatives. Okay? So the ch or the x. You can't say s. You can't say b says. You can't do it. You need the a uh in there. Okay? So, um, so you discovered the rule. Okay? By the way, sometimes I put in a foil, like bus, and the students say, does that mean more than one? No, they put that baby away. Okay? Um, so once we do that, then we'll say, okay, you, you know the rule now. You verbalize it. It might not be the way I did it, but that's okay. It's the rule. Now, let's think of a key word that we can remember this for. So do we, you already know a word that means more than one that you really know how to spell well. Say um, cups. Okay. Then this is your cups rule to make you remember how to, what the rule is. 
and then we go searching for words that follow this pattern, or we um, uh, write some of those words. Some of the other tasks we've used, this is more with primary grades, where we talk about the SATA another way. So I've int introduced um, a particular affix, and then I'm, we're going to talk about uh, how we can s say um, the affixed word in a different way, or the non-affixed words in an affixed way. Okay? So in this case, if we were doing plurals, then we'll say stick, another stick, there are two. Well, how else we can say that there are sticks? Okay? All of these are focused on helping the student understand there's extra meaning on there, what it looks like, what it sounds like, and how, what happens when you stick it on to another word. Okay. Um, the morpheme finding um, affix book one is where um, we'll write out sample words. We did this with first and second graders um, that were target, oh, I'm going to be done about two, um, that are, uh, yeah, that are um, representing words that have more than one meaningful unit in it and writing them in the book or finding pictures that represent them and such. Um, the circle at one where we've talked about a particular affix, uh, they understand what it sounds like, what it means, and then they go searching some text to find that affix and circle it. So in this case, we have been talking about un, I think that's it, yeah. And they go find them all, and then we talk about, huh, so un always means not, it always spelled you in, it's always hooked onto the front of a word. It doesn't change the word when it gets hooked onto it. So we're just reinforcing that idea that we can think about these extra meaningful units, what they look like, what they sound like, and what they mean. Uh, and then this one we did with younger kids, although I think you could do it with older kids too, where we just talk about how we have the base word and we can attach the affix to it or we can take it off. And, but every time we're doing that, we're talking about what does it look like, what does it sound like, what does it mean. Um, so just bombarding them with thinking about uh, additional affixes. All right, so this is the second to last slide. <laughs> All right, um, so remember, morphological awareness is not just for kids who have dyslexia or reading or spelling problems because my research and clinical gut tells me if they were being exposed to this in first grade on up, they would not be struggling with it later on as much. Okay? Um, morphological awareness is part of the state standards. So I, I don't know what this state does. You know, some states said, we're not going to do the common core standards, and the state standards are the common core standards. Okay? <laughs> but so in any state, I'm sure you're going to find something like this where kids are supposed to learn about how they combine uh, knowledge and think about morphology, roots and affixes. So if you're a general ed um, teachers do this because you're meeting the state standards. Okay. Um, I mentioned it can be implemented at the whole class level. It's not going to be prescriptive. So if I do my assessments and find out that Julie has particular issues with thinking about the meaning between base words and drive words, I'm going to focus this on that. Whereas, like I said, if it's going to be the whole class, they're going to get a little of everything and keep cycling through. Okay. Um, and so we have plenty of research to show it can be beneficial at the classroom level as well. So in summary, morphological words is an incredibly important skill for uh, spelling and reading. Um, the th point to keep in mind is people aren't doing a whole lot of it, though, which is unfortunate. Um, Virginia Berninger, who's a friend of mine that I'm sure people have heard in here, she used to say, everybody's so phonocentric. <laughs> they focus so much on phonemic awareness, which you should, but they're not thinking about morphology as well. We know that when kids are provided some kind of morphological awareness intervention, they improve in those skills plus the literacy skills. And then I will leave you with this before we have questions that morphological awareness can impact our ability to communicate effectively and accurately. And I'll leave you with this one. Isn't it amazing how you can find things like this that have to do morphological awareness? <laughs> Questions, comments, or concerns? Thank you so much, Dr. Appel. Thank you. So we have time for a question. Question from the audience. If you have a question, please go to the microphone. Can you go to the microphone? Thank you. We have one right over here.
do you have a book? You're not on. Okay. You should. There you are. Um, is there a reference that you would recommend that we could give to maybe our SLPs to help them understand the relationship of morphology to reading? Uh, well, there are, um, like, articles, you mean? Yes. Yeah, like, there are articles. research. Yes. Re and so there are definitely research articles, but there are also articles that are um, more tutorials on morphological awareness and intervention. There are, what? And there's, yes, that's right. Duh. There's also a special forum in language, speech, and hearing services that's coming out that's purely on morphological awareness. And we just tweeted some papers. Yes. Oh, up there. Okay. I'm and, just uh, wondering if you. Also, um, if you're familiar with topics and language disorders, there's been a number of papers in there that are on morphological awareness development and intervention, such too. Do you have a go to book? Pardon me? Do you have a go to book that would be teacher friendly? Marsha Henry. Marsha Henry. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. What's that? Well, the Louisa's up, and you, everything you need to know is from Louisa. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, this is a question that kind of relates to the overarching question that we're addressing of how to reach all students. Um, the wonderful research in the past 20 years gives us a good handle on phonemic awareness and um, language development and development in general. But wouldn't it make sense or be valuable to create a user-friendly paradigm that teachers could use to engage in like a diagnostic prescriptive approach um, that would benefit all kids, all disability? Yes. Um, I would say um, something that's um, usable and doesn't have to involve a test manual is if uh, teachers and specialists do what to look at when they ask kids to spell, because that can give you a really good window into, into phonology, morphology, and orthography, but they have to know what to look for. And so, but we're always continuing our education, so people can do that too. Once you figure out um, what the the patterns and errors are, then you know what to target. Uh, for the classroom, though, I don't know if any teacher can do assess prescriptively 30 kids. So that's why I would, what we've done before in some studies is they get three weeks of phonemic awareness, three weeks of orthographic knowledge, three weeks of morphological awareness, and just keep cycling through. Thank you. My question is, ha have your studies led to find evidence that Morphological awareness is particularly helpful for people with dyslexia, or is it that it's good for people overall? And do people who don't have dyslexia kind of put those pieces together more naturally the way they put phonological information together? And that's why we've kind of developed some morphological awareness even though our teachers haven't been teaching it. So I think it was yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> um, so we definitely know the students who are struggling to read and spell will struggle with this, typically. Um, and, uh, but we definitely know, just like Kate was saying, there are plenty of kids out there that start picking this up on their own. Um, you know, think about sounds, thinking about meaning. Um, I don't know. It might not happen as much, but when I was growing up and my kids were growing up, like I said, we played language games in there. Kids who are very... Uh, in very high print environments, even at three and four and five, there are definitely kids' books out there that emphasize morphemes. Because I know my son, my grandson's three and a half, and we're reading all the time. And there are some books that call more attention to those. And then most um, parents, grandparents, practitioners who are reading those will start to expand on those as well. So uh, um, I definitely think kids who are in high print homes are already getting some exposure to this, and the parents or the caregivers don't even have a clue that's what they're doing. Mm 